email Pam and like give her a sort of disclosure. Like I mentioned to Samantha at some point in our friendship that we have an email correspondence and that might have been motivation for why she paired us together. She's like, it's cool, whatever. <laughs> um, so I also want to say that before, um, from long before we had an email exchange, uh, Pam's work has been really tremendously important to me. Um, her first book, um, I think it just it came into my life at a time when I was sort of at a I was at like a peak phase of developing my writing and my thinking about writing, and it um, played a really big role in that at that time for me. So. Also, thank you for your work, as well as your friendship and correspondence. Uh, I'm going to start with some water. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read um, segments from a work in progress. Um, right now, it's called The Planned Experiment. margins. I wasn't sure how I would walk through it that day. I had heard that sandstorms might blow about, blurring everything. I had to move carefully through the nexus. I decided to activate the poet. I had to. I couldn't do this alone. She appeared before me. She explained that she would guide me out of the city of margins and through the entrance of the chambers to where the second city lay. But she would be unable to guide me back if I ever wanted to return. I said I understood. She led me to the community center at the corner of 14th Street. I followed her down a flight of stairs and pulled open the metal door. I entered a small dark room and stood in the center of it. At my feet lay a plaque embedded in a large stone. I pushed the knob in the center of the plaque and two doors swung open. There were two paths, one a crawl space into the future, the other blocked by a large unmovable brick that represented the past. Sunlight was creeping through the crawl space. I could hear the sandstorm picking up back home. I kept my head tucked into my chest through the process. When I emerged, I was standing at the edge of a pier, looking out into a vast sea that was engulfing the pier on all sides. The poet was sitting cross-legged next to me, picking at her fingernails. I could see a large ship far off in the distance. The poet said that I could board the ship when it arrived at the pier, and that it might lead me to the second city, or if not there, somewhere similar, or just the same. I asked her how I would know if it was the second city. She shrugged, maybe you won't. All I could make out at this distance was an enormous stone sculpture that appeared to be sitting right at the helm of the ship. It was a bust of a man, a marble statue. I wondered who could be steering a ship if that mass of stone was sitting right there. I turned to ask the poet, but she was fanning herself and refused to glance in my direction. I paced up and down the dock, pounding on my chest. I lit candles. I read books. I tried to prepare for the journey. The ship was approaching. It wouldn't be long now. Entrance to the future. I awoke to find myself curled up in a dusty wooden cabin in the lowest part of the ship. The cabin felt similar to a room I had been in before, but I didn't know this because it was a memory I had long forgotten. A large map was plastered along one world wall. It was disintegrated, barely decipherable. A huge wooden chest lay in the middle of the room. I opened the chest to find a variety of small children inside, all half alive. There were previous selves of me, some more vibrant than others, but all lending to my current perception of things. They were chirping and squealing, trying to catch my attention so, it would, so I would select them to bring them along with me on my journey. I became aware that there were also many other animals in the room. The animals were distracting me, so I killed them all. Then I played a song. It was unidentifiable, and it sounded like every other song about sadness and loss. I stood up from the piano and scrambled up the wall to get out of there, exiting through the muddy door in the hallway, children screeching behind thick cement walls. It felt as though I was trapped in a prison floating on the sea. 
I wondered momentarily if I had crept through the wrong crawl space, but I quickly put the thought out of my head. Perhaps I'd find a new way from here. I didn't see the poet anywhere, but I could feel her watching me. I walked over the entire skeleton of the ship seven times underneath the glowing moonlight. At daybreak, I found myself standing before the huge marble bust of a man, the statue that was steering the ship with its eyes. I climbed to the top of its head in an attempt to overtake the statue and steer the ship myself, but the entire structure crumbled beneath me. Luckily, I didn't break any limbs in the fall. Jutting into my back, right where I had fallen, was a lever to a swing door at the bottom of the ship. I peered through the crack, expecting to see the ocean beneath me, but instead saw a large mass of people marching in the streets of a city below the sea with slogans and signs and megaphones. The poet appeared behind my shoulder. She said this city was an option available to me should I feel compelled to descend into it. I did feel compelled, but it was important for me to keep a top-down perspective, at least at the start. A skull got fractured. A car was on fire and no driver at the wheel. A thin orange haze washed over everything, twisted metal stretching upward. A man opened his wallet and blood poured out. Smattered through the crowd, there were people known as the sisters. They had tried to band together, and they also tried to each do work on their own, but none of it mattered. In an instant, they all rose up as a blue light cast itself around them and swept them away. No one in the crowd even noticed. The poet whispered, the sisters never had a chance. Many said their cause would have to be addressed later, not realizing that it wasn't a cause, but an awakening that needed to happen, and that it would have to be the first thing, not the last. I couldn't bear to watch anymore. I had to enter. The poet nodded her consent. I knew I was destined to go there, because there I was. I climbed down from the passageway, over the heads of the people, and dropped with a plunge into the center of the mass of bodies. Inside were specks of marvel. It was euphoria and chaos combined. It was messy, but it cleaned slates, shedding sharp clarity on every imbalance that existed outside of it, placing everything in question. They said, it was more than we bargained for and everything we ever hoped for. It was everything great and terrible. It was also none of those things. They said, some people thought this was the beginning of the end of the big machine, but we weren't sure if it was even the beginning of the beginning of the end of the big machine. We thought that it was possibly a moment in an endless series of historical moments that never gets beyond its moment. Meanwhile, I was standing inside the belly of the march with my fist raised to the sky. They said, if you don't put your body with the people, then you are aligning yourself with those in power. You're saying that you are okay with the way things are. There is an us and a them. Where you position yourself matters. They said, the barracks were huge storage bins sitting against the early morning light, coasting along a stretch of calm, glistening water that reached out toward the bottom of the city skyline. We were there. We stopped them. We broke things. We kept our clenched fists high. In the meantime, my ship had sunk completely into the sea, and I could no longer climb out of the passageway, back to the present, for there was nothing to climb back to. I had to stay in the future, or the past, whichever it was, I couldn't tell, but the voices kept circling through the mess of forms that I would have to get used to, here in the second city, the city beneath the sea, or somewhere. A vertical thread is woven through the median plane of a body. A woman stands 1,000 miles from her surroundings. She is a blurry photograph, an agent torn from the sharp world piercing up around her. The left hand places itself delicately over her stomach. Her head slacks and rises depending on the tautness of the tether. The thread helps to hold the body intact, though the mind is unaware of its presence. She can barely manage the containment of herself, she is disassociated from the world, but she's very alive. She thrums and thrums. She is collapsed in the corner of a dusty room in an abandoned and deteriorating building. Her, mouth, her body is a mouth, a dark open hole, telling a story, speaking, not speaking. I lift her from the crumpled corner and sling her over my shoulders, around my neck. I carry her on my back, down three flights of creaking stairs, down to the ground floor. I swing the heavy doors open. The bright city stands before us. I step into it. She heaves a sharp breath, gulping cold air into her chest. It is the first time in many years that she has breathed in the city of margins. 
I must carry her out of here right away. I walk carefully through the mirages of glass surfaces as she lies limply around my shoulders. I will carry her naked body for miles and days this way, through the city and beyond its outer limits, across a vast barren landscape that lies between the city of margins and the forest of Parent. I will bring her to my programmer in the forest of Parent. He will know how to repair her the way he did me, for I was a starving swallow once. Now I am a messenger, a force. As we proceed out of the city, I whisper encouraging words to her, though I am careful not to say too much. We make our way slowly through the depleted landscape, heading toward the forest of Parent. It should only be another four hours, I whisper. I imagine how my programmer will be so pleased when I bring her in. Suddenly, her body slips from my grasp. In a brief misstep, I lose her. She slides off my shoulders and stumbles into the desert quickly, sprinting off with a speed I could not imagine. In mere moments, she is a speck in the distance. A few moments more, and she's gone from sight. My gaze hangs longingly in her direction. I wonder what will become of her. What will be her fate? It would have been mine if I had done the same. When I return home with empty arms, my programmer is disappointed. I give him one of my tentacles to make up for the loss. He sits me down in the living room and explains what I need to do next. He would like me to descend into the second city and set up a circumstance for him to scrutinize. He needs five separate beings to stand in the shadows of a dark alleyway and unload illegal cargo. They must get caught by the authorities. One of them must snitch. Another must die. He lays out the plan to me in precise detail. I could use a warm bath and a good night's sleep, but I know I must do this. I have no choice. 